Hey guys, this is Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us on the Thrive Bites podcast. This is season four, and we're so excited for you to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Colin Zhu, double boarded in family and lifestyle medicine, and I interview the best and most passionate health and wellness experts of the industry on this platform. And we talk about plant powered living, emotional resilience, and creating a thriving mindset. And this season, we're taking it live, we're taking it on multiple platforms, and we're taking it as a Q&A discussion as well as our interviewing of our guests. So we're super stoked about this. And please remember to like and subscribe down below, and we will see you. Welcome to the next episode. All right. Well, thank you, everyone to coming to and joining us to the Thrive Bites podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us. You can be anywhere in the world, and you decided to take a few moments to join us, so I really, really appreciate it. Today, we have a special treat for you guys today. Um, we are going to be cooking, and we're going to be cooking live at this moment, uh, not only whole foods plant-based, but you will never guess <laughs> from an RV. Um, and an RV somewhere in America, uh, we will let you know relatively where, um, but I cannot wait uh, to introduce this next guest. Um, her name is Kathy Davis. Um, she is the founder of uh, Veg Inspired, and I'll let her definitely go deeper in her story, but in short, she's a educator by trade, and she's a plant-based foodie. Um, with a lot of passion, and she's been sharing her recipes, uh, you know, for the world since 2014. And she's hoping that the creation of Veg Inspired is going to inspire others to eat more plants. And I love it. And uh, she considers herself a whole foods plant-based educator. And uh, with her husband, John, they travel around all over uh, the country um, in an RV, and uh, they share their recipes uh, virtually. So. Uh, without further ado, um, I can't wait to introduce to Kathy. Hello, how's it going? <laughs> oh, I'm so excited to be here with you from my RV. <laughs> I love it. Oh my God. I'm just going to like, you know, just, just solo capture you right now. Oh my God. Can you believe that that is in your RV right now? That is not so. <laughs> it's wild. Oh, man. So, um, you know, I know that today, you know, the main topic of our uh, uh, session today is cooking, making whole foods plant based simple, you know, and cooking it from an RV, right? You are a cookbook author. You're a cookbook author of three uh, wonderful, beautiful books, um, you know, and uh, I can't wait for you to share the story. But this happened over, you know, the whole transition of the pandemic. Um, while you've been in an RV, which is an incredible story. So um, I like asking my guests, you know, from the origin, how they got from uh, point A to point B. So how did this all come about? You know, I know that you've been a foodie before, um, you know, your transition took, you know, uh, into light, you know, before the pandemic, but how did this all transpire? Wow. Yeah. So um, plant-based living was introduced to me by my husband. He kind of read a couple of you know, contradictory information and was like, we need to figure out what the healthiest option is. And we were huge foodies who went to the diners, right? The diets restaurant, we always ate, you know, as much organic and whole fresh foods that we could. We loved to cook. He loved to cook. And he introduced plant-based eating to me. And I was like, whoa, I would, I'm going to tell you, I'm the biggest resistor. So if you're capping upon this video and you are like, oh, I don't know if I could ever go fully plant-based. I was there eight years ago. And it took me a lot of experimenting with foods and trying familiar foods to me, lots of potatoes, lots of vegetables that I liked, lots of things that I liked to really learn that plant-based eating or veganism wasn't what I thought it was going to be. It took me about six months to fully transition. I would consider myself an ethical vegan at that point. That was about seven years ago. And, you know, fast forward, we started Veg Inspired, shared a lot of recipes, really loved the passion and really inspiring people to eat more plants and not necessarily being perfect. 
And I've really taken that intention over perfection motto and that eat more plants motto to heart. And that's how I work with people who are interested in making this transition. So three years ago was when we decided we were going to sell our home, our sticks and bricks in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and hit the road full time in an RV. And at the time we'd been developing recipes and shooting YouTube videos and all of that. So I had to have a gorgeous kitchen to be able to do all of those in. And, you know, as things unfolded, right. And, um, you know, the pandemic hit and we were making more recipes and really getting out there, the opportunity to write a cookbook came and I always wanted to write one. And so I took the opportunity and it was a really tight deadline and they loved it. And then it was another cookbook and another cookbook. And so now here we are a year and a half after, or about a year after I submitted the first manuscript with three published cookbooks, a plant-based coaching program and veg inspired still active and running. So it's exciting to be here and be able to share my story and my recipes with all of you. And I apologize if the camera's moving. My cat is hanging out on the table right now. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. I think by this time uh, with so many zoom calls and, you know, virtual uh, connectivity, um, you know, issues that we've had, you know, we've just gotten quite used to it. So, but Kathy, thank you so much for sharing uh, that story because, um, you know, there's always uh, some excuse, you know, as a family practitioner, you know, I work in the office, I work in a clinic. Uh, now I, you know, see patients online now. And, um, you know, I teach people, I meet them, you know, where they're at. And I, you know, see patients and meet them from all over the spectrum, from being an extreme carnivore to an extreme vegan. And my model is exactly like yours and if that's to eat more plants but you somehow you know busted at least the top three myths right um of you know and by doing that into each cookbook so you know can you go into a little bit about what each of those cookbooks you know is able to bust and what people can find if they open up one of your cookbooks absolutely so the cookbook that we're going to cook out of today is the budget friendly cookbook and this cookbook busts the myth that plant-based eating is expensive. And I always tell people, you have a choice. You know, you can buy pre-packaged foods that, you, that are convenient, that you don't have to do anything with, but those are going to be more costly. But plant-based eating can actually be very, very economical. Beans, rice, local vegetables, seasonal vegetables, frozen if you need to. You know, picking the, the food that looks the best and has you know, it's full flavor and full color intact and really is the, the freshest is always the option that I go for. It, I would love to shop all organic and have all beautiful organic food. But as somebody who travels the country, that's not always the case. So I'm always looking for the freshest looking food, you know, the tomatoes that look the ripest, the, the fresh herbs that just really hold their color and their scent. And that's just one of the tips that I have in this cookbook. Um, this cookbook is unique because it does have a three week meal plan to really get you started on budget friendly cooking. So that's the most recent book. And I'm going to share all these books. They're all available on Amazon, but if you don't shop Amazon, that's okay. You can grab the ISBN number from the Amazon listing and order it from any local bookstore. So if you prefer to shop more with your local bookstore, you can definitely do that. So then our first cookbook, was the 30 minute whole food plant-based cookbook. And this cookbook, similar to the budget friendly, it kind of covers the gamut of your appetizers, your soups, your snacks, your salads, your main dishes, your desserts. Yep, plant-based, whole food plant-based desserts. But this book does it all in 30 minutes or less. Um, and this one has a very strong salt, oil, and no, no refined sugar free messaging. This book also, the whole the budget-friendly book, is also salt, oil, and sugar-free. So it really allows you to use those whole natural sweeteners, maple syrup, dates, things of that nature, and more of those whole unrefined foods. Then we get into the fun one. And I always say this is the fun one because it's categorized. So in the super easy plant-based cookbook, you have no-cook recipes, five-ingredient recipes, another round of 30 minute recipes. And then my favorite are these one pot meals, the meals that are basically put it all into a pot and cook it, put it all in a sheet pan and cook it in the oven, put it all in, 
your instant pot or your Dutch oven or wherever you're doing your cooking and it's just one pot. And as you can see, cooking from an RV, I do not have a dishwasher. So these hands do all the dishwashing. So one pot meals are super important to me. So that's kind of how I bust the myths, right? Time, ease, and budget. I've got an answer for all of the excuses. I love it. I love it. And uh, I can't wait for, you know, our audience members to, you know, get a hold. And uh, when the show is done airing, you know, we'll make sure we'll put those uh, links into uh, the show notes. So, um, yeah. So um, I can't wait for us to get in. Um, uh, today is also September 15th, the day of recording, the, the day um, going live. And it's also the first day of Hispanic Heritage Month. And because of that, we, uh, you know, kind of, you know, work together offline to uh, prepare a couple of things um, in respect to that. So, Kathy, what are, what are you going to prepare for us uh, today? Yeah, so today we're going to whip up one of my super easy taco seasoning mixes. And a lot of people ask me, why do you make your own taco seasoning mix? Why don't you just buy it in a package? And one of the big reasons that I make my own is because I can control the ingredients. So I can leave out the excess salt. I can leave out all those weird caking agents and filtering agents and other names I can't even pronounce. And I can use whole fresh um, spices and herbs from my kitchen and I can make as much or as little as I need. And then we're gonna use that taco seasoning blend to make a delicious black bean quinoa soup. So I'm really excited. It's a one pot out of the budget friendly cookbook. And it's so fun, and I have lots of pro tips for you all along the way. Awesome. I can't wait. Um, so as you're cooking, you know, I will kind of chime in, comment, ask any questions. But, uh, yeah, is there um, – I guess my first question is, you know, as you were thinking about each and one of these recipes, has there been – kind of like a very unique backstory to it? Or are you one of those cookbook authors that just like trial and error, experiment in the kitchen? Or, you know, was there, you know, one recipe that kind of like, you know, I don't know, dropped on your head or something like that? Do you have a unique uh, story to show? Uh, to you know, share? I mean, I, after writing three cookbooks, I've got so many stories. Um, but one of the one of the things about writing the cookbook is it really does take a lot of testing. It takes a lot of trial and error. And I like to refer back to that first cookbook. Since it was the first one, it felt as though it was this huge mountain to climb. And I, I did a lot of planning ahead of time. I did a lot of recipe testing. Some days I would test well into the evening and early morning hours. I remember some nights we were, we were eating you know, I was feeding my husband soup or some other recipe that I had tested at one or two in the morning. And it's just weird to be eating, you know, breakfast food that late at, that late at night or that early. <laughs> at and also odd to be eating, you know, soup for breakfast. But a lot of times it, I needed to know what it would taste like the next day, what it would taste like if it was frozen and things of that nature. So really kind of digging in. And what I found was in that 30 minute book, a lot of recipes ended up in set the second and third books because in the beginning I couldn't get them done in 30 minutes. And I had to start really learning different techniques. And I use a lot of um, fresh or dried spices and herbs to really speed up the cooking process, but not, not really lose the flavor. So that's gotcha. some kind of a fun story to go along with that. And then I have so many favorite recipes that we can, you know, we can continue to talk about through the cooking process. Okay. Well, I'll let you, uh, I'll let you start with the, the seasoning blend first. So. Yes, absolutely. So as I love tacos and I, one of the big transitioning foods that we ate a lot of were tacos. We would take potato tacos, we would take potatoes and we would cook them up in taco seasoning. So I always really wanted my own seasoning blend and I would mix different things and try different things and I would, you know, cook up an onion. But when you have a blend that you can just tablespoon out into recipes, it needs to be able to be stored in the fridge or in the, in the pantry. So that's how this recipe was really born was I wanted to control the ingredients that went into my spice blend. So we're going to start with two tablespoons of chili 
of chili powder. And I always tell everybody about chili powder. Check the ingredients in the chili powders that you buy because some of them have oil. Some of them have other strange ingredients. They're not, they're not always straight chilies. They're often a blend, which is fine. You can use a chili powder blend, but I like to avoid the oil. So that was two tablespoons of chili powder. And then next up is two teaspoons of paprika. I always double check because you never want to put two teaspoons of cayenne pepper in place of paprika, right? You want to make sure <laughs> you're reading those ingredients, especially live, because that would make for a really scary taste test later. Yeah. <laughs> Next. I mean, I wish, I wish we can taste test. <laughs> well, I'll get to taste, but I where, wish I could. Where, 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 where physically are you currently at right now? Oh, yes. I am currently parked in um, uh, Eastern Tennessee outside of the Smoky Mountains. So this was oh, two wow. teaspoons of onion powder. And we actually just finished. We're on the end of the, a large loop that we did that took us all the way out to Glacier National Park this summer. So that's one of the goals that we have is to visit all the U.S. national parks. So definitely if you want to follow along with that, you can, you can follow along as, you know, as we give the links to do that later. This is one teaspoon of dried oregano. Now we're going to move to the half teaspoons. And we have half a teaspoon of garlic powder. I should have taken the little plastic things off. I have a question with regards with uh, garlic and onion. You know, those are kind of like one of the most foundational ingredients in many, many different cultures, right? So when they're turned into a powder, does that mean that it's more concentrated in flavor? Like, what is the difference for audience members who might be thinking? Um, you know, what was the difference between that and the fresh ingredient of, of, you know, you know, raw garlic and onion? Yes. So a, a about a tablespoon of onion powder is about a half of an onion and about an eighth of a teaspoon of garlic powder is one clove. Mm. So when you think about the concentration you really want to make sure that you're not like, oh, it calls for one clove. I'll do a tablespoon because that'll be really, really garlicky. <laughs> this is half a teaspoon of ground cumin. And then the last ingredient is cayenne pepper. Now, I am a wimp. So our taco seasoning only gets an eighth of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper. My husband would probably put in a half a teaspoon because he's a chili head. I'm not. <laughs> so if you want yours a little, your tacos to be a little spicier, you can add more cayenne pepper. Awesome. So I like to mix this in a small jar with a lid. Put the lid on and just give it a shake to kind of blend all those ingredients. And then I store my chili spices in the refrigerator. So I would store this um, up to about a month in a cool, dry place. So I would store it in the refrigerator because we travel, our climate changes. And so I just like to keep it cool and um, I don't, because it doesn't have any anti-caking ingredients or anything in it. So you, I just wanted to keep it cool and does not let humidity or moisture get in. Mm -hmm. So that's our taco seasoning. And that can be found on page 134 in the book. And after we're doing, as we're doing the, Soup, I also want to highlight some other ways that you can use that taco seasoning uh, throughout other recipes that you might make. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Quick question about your, your, you know, why you're doing this through an RV is how do you keep the power on? <laughs> so we are, we are currently parked in an RV park. Uh -huh. So we, we are, we have access to electric hookups. Mm -hmm. uh, we do not have solar uh, or a generator. So we always require electric. We always require a full hookup site for that electric plug-in. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but solar is on our list. We would love to be able to have solar and be out in the, the boondocks off the grid living in an RV. As long as we yeah, can get service, yeah. it could be anywhere. Because, you know, obviously having a, you know, stationary uh, kitchen, um, you know, it's important to kind of keep that, you know, power on, you know, for the fridge, for, you know, all the ingredients to make it, you know, stay cool and the freezer to stay cold. So I'm just like thinking, you know, what if, you know, do you ever turn off the, the, the truck, the vehicle that's attached to it? Do you have a generator? Like how do things stay cool? You know what I'm saying? Yes. So this is in, this is considered an RV refrigerator and it actually can run on electric and propane. So mm -hmm. we wintered this past year in Texas and we did lose power during the storms. Um, mm -hmm. And we just switched the refrigerator to propane. Mm -hmm. um, but when we drive, we just keep everything sealed up in the refrigerator. And the last thing we do before we pull out of a park is unhook the electric. And then that's the first thing we do when we arrive is mm -hmm. put the electric back in. So, you know, I kind of feel as since we don't, travel with meat or dairy it's mostly keeping our vegetables and our condiments and things like that cold we don't have a lot of food spoilage because we don't mm. eat food that really spoils well it makes you it makes you think of being more efficient while you can as you travel so yes that's awesome all right so i'll let you go to the next step yeah so that's that's all for the taco seasoning so we're going to get started on our quinoa black bean taco soup so this soup is literally takes minutes to prepare and about 25 minutes to cook. So we'll continue to talk and share some stories while this cooks up. What I'm going to do is in my large saucepan, I am going to add. So in this, in this, I have four cups of liquid, three cups are vegetable broth and one cup is water. So into the saucepan, we're going to put in the three cups of vegetable broth and the one cup of water without spilling it. Next, we're gonna add one can of black beans. This is about a cup and a half if you cook your own black beans and they've been drained and rinsed. So I'm gonna just put those in the pot. I'm also going to add one cup of frozen corn. Now I rinse it so that it doesn't have the excess water on it or the any, sometimes things go a little freezer burnt because we do turn the fridge, you know, the fridge is on and off or it changes a little bit in temperature. Right. So this right. is rinsed, we'll add that to the pot. And then we're also going to add half of a cup of rinsed quinoa. So I have not done that yet because I just wanted to show you that I use the same mesh strainer that I use for my, to strain my beans right for the quinoa. So I'm just going to dump that in and just give it a quick rinse. So that was a half a cup of rinsed quinoa. Now I think I think from my angle you're using uh, either white or yellow quinoa. Um, I've noticed other forms of quinoa that are like darker uh, red. Um, have you noticed any difference in terms of like cooking or the taste quality of it? Um, no, I use them interchangeably. I I haven't really noticed a difference. Um, I I do. I, I kind of like to vary it up. I always tell my clients, like, let's not get in a meal rut. If you have always used white quinoa, try that tri-color blend. Um, I just I just like it for a different variety. So I don't really notice a taste difference. If other people are commenting and they do notice a taste difference, I'd love to know. But I've never noticed a real taste difference. Maybe because I use so much flavoring with my recipes. <laughs> I don't know. The next thing we're going to put in is actually the entire batch of taco seasoning. Just really going to add that depth of flavor and that taco flavor to this. Now, the taco seasoning makes 
about two tablespoons. That means about three tablespoons. So if you are using a store-bought taco seasoning, you're going to want about three tablespoons of that taco seasoning mix. And then our last ingredient is one teaspoon of nutritional yeast. Now, people often ask, why do you put nutritional yeast in your soups? Why do you put it in um, other recipes? And a lot of people will say, oh, it gives it a cheesy flavor. But I actually think it pulls out more of a, an umami flavor. And what I really like about that is it kind of gives it that buttery, brothy flavoring. And I just, I just like it. So I add a little bit of nutritional yeast to almost all of the soups that I make because I think it really pulls in that nostalgic, almost like the chickeny broth flavor. So what we're yeah. going to do is we're going to bring this to a boil over. We're going to, first we're going to bring this to a boil. So I know you're going to hear my conduction or my induction cooktop. So I'm going to put it over high heat to bring it to a boil. And then we can go into talking a few more stories. All right. Well, I definitely share with people and, uh, you know, tell people to wherever you can to add nutritional yeast. And it does, um, you know, people who love cheese, I think that's kind of like one of the last things uh, people have a hard time uh, letting go is cheese, you know, because of that umami, salty, you know, that savory component of cheese, right? The ageness, um, you know, and I'm glad that, you know, there are better uh, plant-based alternatives, um, you know, for example, nutritional yeast. Um, but what, uh, you know, I know Kathy, you already know this, but, you know, it has a lot of B vitamins um, that we definitely need, um, you know, to be included in our whole foods plant-based, um, especially when we process things like, for example, you know, brown rice, uh, you know, into white rice, you know, you're losing, you know, that fiber component, you're losing those, you know, B vitamin components, you know, from the outer shell. So, you know, wherever you can, just like, you know, Kathy is doing, it's beautifully just to, you know, dump it in wherever you can. I actually put some, I kid you not, I actually put a little bit in my smoothies, not to the point where you actually can taste it, but, you know, just enough to say like, hey, I've got my B vitamins today. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a great idea. I never thought to add it to smoothies. I actually use it in a couple of my desserts to really pull in that buttery flavor. And it just, it really kind of changes, doesn't change it too much, but it gives it enough of that buttery flavor that you're not like, oh, this is missing butter. Or like, oh, this mm -hmm. is has that buttery goodness. And I really <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. I, I, going back to what you said about people not wanting to give up cheese, one of the big things that I've found is cheese is like this rich, luxurious texture. And so one of my favorite alternatives is to, on, a, on like a veggie pizza, after the pizza's cooked, add a little bit of diced avocado. That creaminess of the avocado really brings mm. back that luxurious, creamy, like gooey kind of taste. I don't mean like smash yeah. the guacamole, but just a little bit of avocado just gives it a nice, a nice zing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's all about that fat, right? So. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's see, let's pull in a, a couple of comments. Um, Let's see. I believe you may know this person. Um, this yeah. is Joanne Lakes. Uh, she says, hi, Kathy. You have a much bigger galley than I do on my sailboat. I know. Further... But this would be an easy <laughs> recipe that you could do on your sailboat. Super easy. <laughs> and she further adds, uh, we have solar, inverter, and a generator on the boat. I'm like, wow. The, inv the inverter makes the gener generator useful. And then she asks, is your fridge frost free? It is most definitely not frost free and it gets a huge glacier in the back that we have to uh, defrost from it fairly often. It's actually kind of a pain. There are some yeah. things that you can use that people say they put like plastic cutting boards in the back that you can just kind yeah. of shimmy out and it pulls it off. But oh, it's like an adventure that we're chipping away a glacier. Yeah. And she says, she comments that she completely agrees that Nooch, quote unquote, gives a great umami taste slash mouthfeel. So thank you, Joanne. Yes, thank you um, for tuning in. I'm so glad you're here with us. <laughs> so are we. 
Uh, do you have a, uh, a a unique story to share um, as we're still uh, as we're still uh, cooking? Uh, one of the questions, if you guys have, are just tuning in, uh, this is Thrive Bites. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and we have Kathy Davis here uh, with us, and uh, we are cooking whole foods plant based from an RV, uh, and we're somewhere in uh, I think you said off of the Smoky Mountains in East Tennessee, right? East Tennessee, yes, that's where we are. <laughs> and guys, if you like this, please, uh, you know, continue to like, comment, give us our questions and subscribe to the channel. Um, but Kathy was just about to go into, uh, I asked her uh, as she was, you know, going through this one in a year half period of the pandemic and creating these three beautiful cookbooks uh, to share a unique story of how she, uh, I guess, come, you know, comes about, you know, um, her recipe uh, making. Yes. So one of the one of the things that I really love about writing the cookbooks was kind of taking familiar foods and giving them a unique twist. So looking at recipes like tacos, how can we make tacos a little more unique? Can we do more of a cauliflower taco? Or can we do, because I love tacos, so I feel like I'm always talking about tacos. Can we do sweet potato tacos? And I came across a recipe. It was um, inspired by... I've probably seen it in dozens of places, probably on um, uh, diners, drive-ins, and dives, or in another cookbook. But it was it was tacos made with meat and pineapple, and I love pineapple on all things. I'm the team pineapple on pizza. I love pineapple smoothies. I just love pineapple salsas. I love it all. So I was like, uh -huh. how can I make this plant-based recipe kind of meaty, but also have that pineapple pizzazz? And so I use chickpeas. Normally when I make tacos, you're just sauteing up the veggies, warming them up, throwing them in the tacos. But for this unique recipe, which is in the super easy plant-based cookbook, I did a sheet pan meal. And I apologize if you can hear the rain. We are starting to get some rain right now. I, <laughs> I thought it was, I actually thought it was the cooking. <laughs> so I it was the no, bubbling. <laughs> it is the rain and it sounds like it's coming down pretty hard out there. Um, so this recipe, this recipe that I'm talking about is, the, is a chickpea El Pastor, and it is chickpeas, onions, and pineapple roasted on a sheet pan in the oven dry. And then about five minutes before you're done cooking it at a pretty high temperature, about five minutes before you're done cooking it, you toss it in a lime and soy sauce or liquid aminos mixture, and then add in those familiar taco -y spices, so cumin, coriander, things of that nature. Yeah. And then you warm it back up so that that all gets all nice and baked into the flavors. And then you serve the chickpea, onion, and pineapple in a tortilla with a fresh pineapple cilantro onion salsa. And it is perfect. It is so flavorful and it is so easy to make because you literally throw it in a pan and put it in the oven. So that was one of my favorite stories and really that's why I get a lot of my inspiration either going out to rest with restaurants vegan restaurants or going out to um trying to think going into you know grocery stores and seeing different herbs and spices we were in one grocery store in Texas and they had a huge wall of dried spices and I found dried mint and I was like ooh I could use this in like a Mediterranean type type dish and I ended up with this perfectly delicious stew that I finished with that dried mint and it's just fun to experiment and try different things and you know that's one of the cool parts of traveling the country is that I get to go to all these neat places with all their different cultures. Oh, I love it. Coming back to cooking our soup is now in a boil so we're going to reduce it to medium I'm going to reduce it to medium low, which for me is about number four. And then we're going to cover it and simmer it for 15 minutes. I think it actually goes. So this, so this is a, a an induction cooktop for those of you that are watching. I actually have a propane stove behind me, but none of you want to see me with my back. So we had to get this this fun cooktop when we started yeah. doing YouTube videos in the RV so that they could be right here and it was forward facing. 
That's awesome. <laughs> I, I was we were talking off camera when I first saw her uh, kitchen galley. I was like, that can't be an RV. It, it just looks too nice. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so as you're cooking, um, you know, what are some unique places because your journey is traveling to, you know, uh, for those of you are watching who haven't heard the beginning of uh, the episode, uh, Kathy was just sharing with us that she and her husband, John, travel all over the country visiting uh, all the national parks of the United States of A and, uh, you know, cooking from their RV. So my question is, you know, has there been any unique uh, markets, farmers markets um, or just, you know, uh, produce areas um, that, you know, just you haven't really come across? You know, have you had any uh, experiences like that? Uh, so yes, we actually, you know, it's always the little towns that have seem to have like the best local produce and local produce stands. I mean, the big cities, of course, they can get in like different markets and places like that. But we love the little town local grocery stores. It always seems like they have you know something local that's that's unique to them. Um, we actually came across a really awesome farmers market in Ohio, um, and. The, the cool thing was, it was the honor system. So we walked in and it's not manned by anyone. It's an actual building with like a door. And it says, you know, welcome. Um, we're out in the fields picking and harvesting. So this is all on the honor system. It tells you exactly what to do. Get your, you know, cabbage, weigh it, and then multiply it by this amount. Or, you know, and it just walked you through. And the produce was amazing. And it was so cool because... You know, here these local farmers are out doing their farming and we're in their store actually kind of doing the work. And so it was neat that they said, you know, you being able to pack your own groceries and work on honor system allows us to keep our rates low. And I just love that. I just love the community supported wow. uh, local markets and of that nature. And we just, we really enjoy finding little markets that we can go to uh, on our travels. And it's, it's really fun to just, connect with people and hear their stories too. Yeah, no, that that's amazing. And, you know, you, you don't really, I mean, I, you know, I'm originally from New Jersey and the first time, you know, I got to live out state was West Virginia and great states, great group of people. And for me, being a Jersey boy, being in the Appalachian mountains was kind of like a culture shock. You know what I'm saying? I couldn't tell it was a culture shock for me or it was a culture shock for them looking at me. So, um, so anyway, but, uh, it was, you know, you just, you find similarities, you know, you find, we have our differences, you find similarities. And that's what I love about, you know, uh, traveling, you know, is to be able to find those nuances that connect us. Um, a good question um, that I thought of that I discuss with my patients all the time is, you know, what are the key differences um, maybe pros and cons that you, that from your experience that you can share between like, you know, a farmer's market that you visit, like a local Sunday market versus like an ethnic market versus like a, a chain supermarket. What, what are the differences, you know, would you say? And, you know, do you have any pros and cons to share? Yeah. So one big difference that I find is that there's a lot more variety. Like, I feel like there's a lot of variety in larger grocery stores that have access to more suppliers, but oftentimes that food is trucked in. So a local tomato that's grown locally, it just it just seems to taste better than maybe a tomato that was picked a long time ago and then shipped via truck and refrigerated the whole time. And so we really try to shop as local as we can. Um, one thing that was surprising to me was, so we talked about how we're traveling the country to visit the national parks, and we have stayed in some cities where there are really little towns, and not cities, they're small towns outside of the national park entrances, because we always need to be in relation to cell service in order to be able to serve, you know, my clients do my job, and then my husband work for the company that he works for, and we encountered a few towns that had very, very small grocery stores. They, they, their produce section was very small, but a lot of it was local. It wasn't a lot of organic because they weren't shipping a lot in, but it looked very fresh. And it almost, it, I almost prefer the smaller ones over the larger ones. As somebody who was 
you know, ethical vegan in the beginning, five years, eating a lot more of the processed vegan foods. I actually like it when there's less vegan options because I'd rather eat my whole food plant-based options, potatoes, brown rice, beans, lots of veggies, frozen veggies, fruits, um, my spices and things of that nature that I can pretty much get anywhere. And so that's really been something that was eye-opening to me because I used to feel like I could only be vegan, only plant-based if I could get to all Whole Foods or Trader Joe's. And what I found is it's actually easier to be whole food plant-based when the options are limited because you're eating the foods that are more nutritious and more nutri nutrient dense for you. This yeah. is easy. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna have a fun time. Controlling an RV. I know. I'm gonna have a fun time post editing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I totally agree with you. Like whenever I discuss plant-based cooking with my patients, um, you know, their first their first uh, impression is that you know Whole Foods plant-based is really really uh, expensive. They have to buy everything organic, and they always they feel like they can only obtain those items. From, an, uh, from a, a Whole Foods, you know what I'm saying? Um, or a Trader Joe's, which, you know, is, you know, less expensive. Um, but, you know, from my experience, I mainly grew up um, in big urban metropolitan areas. So I've always uh, valued uh, the cultural diversity and their respective stores. So right now I'm in Los Angeles. We have a lot of Mexican markets, right? Um, growing up in Jersey, you know, we had a lot of Asian and Indian markets and, you know, comparatively to chain supermarkets, for example, their herbs and spices, their grains and beans and legumes, you know, um, you know, their peas, they're significantly cheaper um, than, you know, what you would get at the chain markets. And so I try to, unless you, you know, go yourself, it's hard to really describe to people, you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. And that's, that is one of the things that we really noticed too. When we, when we lived in Pittsburgh, we frequented a lot of the specialty markets because you could get foods that were more um, culturally represented. So I could, I could easily get jackfruit. I could easily get, you know, bulk tofu at the Asian market. And it really allows you to kind of diversify what you're eating. Spice blends can be much cheaper. And it really, like I said, you know, for me, eating plant-based has widened my palate and showed me a whole new world of cooking and eating and flavors and cuisines and my appreciation for being able to buy a lot of those ethnic foods in the markets not only am i supporting a local business but that they're accessible right the things that we want to try are available in those markets yeah exactly um i wanted to post a couple of comments uh one of them is from Whispering Bee, Whispering Bee ASMR, she says the road to Hana in Maui has an honor system with the fruit that the locals have for course, which is really yeah. cool, which makes me think it's something that was like off of the road. Um, and uh, similar to, you know, to the story that you shared that they had to go off and do something else. So, um, and then this is your friend again. She says years ago, uh, Joanne writes years ago, uh, before I was vegan, there was a fish market that had the honor system, and I love I love the faith that they have in mankind. <laughs> yes, I do too. I just thought it was so cool. It almost makes me want to pay a little bit more for stuff. Like, don't you have to discount it? Like, I just want to support these, these people that are out in their farms. Yeah, it's really cool. Yeah, it's really cool. And you know, I for sure. So, uh, you know, for those uh, of, of us that are joining in, what are we? Uh, can you review what we're cooking and what you're preparing right now? Yes. So the first recipe we did was our taco seasoning blend, pretty much a chili spice, chili, chili powder spice blend that we use for tacos. And I do want to highlight a couple of other ways that you can use that uh, throughout the cookbook. Um, and then in the pot right now, we have a quinoa and black bean soup that is easy. It was just dump everything in the pan and simmer it until the quinoa is done. And what you see me cutting up right here is this soup can be served as is delicious but if you do have some of these other ingredients on hand you can serve it with some fresh squeezed lime juice some shredded cabbage and if you did catch i was actually peeling the leaves off so this is a pro tip you can keep cabbage in your fridge
coverage for much longer than you normally would if you actually peel the leaf and shred the leaves instead of cutting into the head of cabbage. It allows the moisture to stay in the head of cabbage, allowing it to stay fresh longer. So we just keep it in a mesh bag in the crisper drawer. And as we need a little bit of that cruciferous crunch, we just peel off a leaf or two and add it to salads, add it to tacos, sprinkle it on a, a soup for that just added crunch. And then also, also you can add it, add in some salsa if you want to serve it with some chunky salsa. I did not make a salsa. I had salsa in the fridge, so I was just going to use that. And then last, I was just going to cut up a little bit of cilantro and garnish it with that. All of these garnishes are, are optional, but they do add a nice little variety to the soup. So you can make it the first day as is, and then throughout the week, you can add in some other flavors. That's a tip that I have if you want to batch cook a huge pot of chili, you know, and you don't want to eat a bowl of chili every day because I get like sick of leftovers. I'll do chili in a bowl and then I'll do chili over rice and chili over potatoes and then maybe a chili carrot dog and really kind of diversify <laughs> I'm using those those batch cooked meals so that I'm not feel like I'm eating the same thing every day. Gotcha. We gotcha. Have about four minutes left on our soup and then I'll just check that quinoa and to go. Oh, and this is another pro tip. You can store your um, fresh herbs in a glass jar of water. Um, when you bring them home from the store, I always wash them so that when I cut them, they're already dry. And then all I do is pull them apart, discard the ends that were in the water because I don't want to use those. And then I just chop them. This is cilantro, so you can actually use the stems. If it were parsley, I would pull the leaves off. And then I just finally chop it up and I'll just garnish my soup with it. And then with this, I'll just put a produce bag over top of it and keep it in the refrigerator and change the water. I've had fresh cilantro last for a, over a month in the in the RV fridge, in a regular fridge too, um, just by preparing it that way. So when you bring it home, you wash it, you cut the ends and you get them right into water. Wow, that's that's amazing. Love the pro tips, right? That's yeah. That's no, that's really, right? that's really, that's really, that's really what it is. That's really what it is. Is because you want to dip into someone's experience, right? So, yeah. I mean, what you wouldn't want to give to like ask, you know, uh, I don't know, maybe like a random chef on uh, Food Network, you know, you know, what's the best tip for so and so? You know, what I'm saying so. Um, where so tell us a little bit about your journey how um are you almost done with the the national park um you know traveling like where are you you know in that in that journey wow so we started like i said earlier on this in the show we started our being full-time in october of 2018 it was the rv was brand new we'd never towed we'd never we camped a few times with friends and their rv but we never had our own and it was a whole adventure. And so about six months in, we were like, we should really start doing the National Park Survey. Like, that should be our goal. Like, it was our goal to go to all the contiguous uh, U U.S. states. But really seeing those national parks became something that everybody talked about. We're like, you've got to get to Glacier. You've got to go to the Dry Tortugas. So we are halfway through the states. We're at about state 26. I think this was, I think, um, Kentucky was our last state sticker on our map, and then we've been to Tennessee before, so we didn't get a new sticker this time. But we're at about, I think, National Park 18 or 19 out of 63. So we've wow. really, really done a fraction of them. And people will always ask, well, how long are you going to do this? And we're, we're very, like, real. We're going to do it as long as, as long as we're able to, because the lifestyle is amazing. And I wouldn't yeah. train grateful every day wake up and I'm like this is my life and I love it that's awesome and it's just you and your husband you don't have kids uh, I know you have a couple of cats behind the camera right yeah they're behind the camera and we do not have <laughs> children just just for children and uh they they actually ride so we're in a fifth wheel so that they actually ride in the truck with us and then they get to come and explore the RV, when we open the windows, they're in every window looking out. They love the bird watch. It's really fun. Our That's soup awesome. is done. I'm going to grab something that lifts the lid off. Well, it beeps. I always like to check. It's 
smells like tacos in here. I wish I could show it to you, but if I did, you're gonna have to you're gonna have to like freeze you're gonna have to like freeze dry uh, dry it and send it by FedEx to me. <laughs> oh man. So it is really good. Let me get a bowl to put it in. The quinoa looks perfectly cooked. Yeah. And that was bring it to a boil and simmer it covered for 15 minutes. Are you able to do it in a glass bowl and then like show it in front of the camera? I can do it in one of these small glass bowls, sure. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then you can, you know, uh, you know, ladle it and serve it, uh, you know, traditionally and plate it later. Uh, yeah. I just would love the audience to kind of see, see it, so. So I was getting a ladle from under the stove. <laughs> There is our soup, black bean, quinoa, and then it has some fresh corn. And then, like I said, I would garnish it with our lime, a squeeze of lime, a little bit of cabbage, and a little bit of cilantro. Oh, wow. And then I can come around here. Can I give you guys a close up? Yes. Oh, I love it. So it's like, oh, there's a awkward reflection that's better so it's yeah like yummy, yeah like, it's what i love about it is it has like this brothy soup but it's also kind of stew like because it has the thick the quinoa gets a little bit thicker and then you've got your black beans and your corn so yeah now, now it's done i know we talked it's been a little bit of an hour but that was done in about 25 minutes it was easy easily something you can put together on a fall fall evening after dinner I hope you guys really like it. Yeah. <laughs> it smells so good. I'm so excited. Oh, well, Kathy, uh, you know, thank you so, so much. Um, that was a beautiful presentation. And, you know, you not only have you made three books, you know, in the span of a year and a half under the pandemic in an RV, right? You were able to, you know, give this demonstration uh, from your beautiful kitchen in an RV and with pouring rain. You know, if you guys hear that in the background, that's not actually <laughs> her cooking. That's actually the rain. Uh, and, and I was like, oh man, I got to do a lot of, you know, post editing for this one. Um, but yeah, I'm, it just goes to show you that, you know, um, you know, you can do things under pretty much any circumstance. And Kathy, you've done a beautiful job in spades. So I really, really appreciate it. Um, you know, for those that want to, you know, learn more about you or get your books, can you uh, say again, how can we reach you and uh, find your cookbooks? Yeah, I would love that. So you can find me at Veg Inspired on Instagram. That's the best way to connect with me. Uh, veginspired.com. I have links to all the cookbooks. Uh, you can also, I have a free Facebook group where I do lives every week. If, this is, if you like tuning in for lives and you want to be part of that, it's veginspired.com slash foodies. And it gets you direct contact with me. I do moderate my own Facebook group. Um, and then I just really want to thank you, Dr. Collin, for having me on, sharing my expertise. It's been a great conversation. I'd love to come back anytime. And I hope you all love these recipes. I, I'm really passionate about plant-based eating and making it accessible to everyone. And I'm just grateful to be here. <laughs> well, we thank you. Thank you very, very much. And, uh, you know, we can't wait to continue to follow you on your journey as you travel through the United States um, and uh, see where life will take you. And uh, we look forward to more cookbooks, you know, down the road. Um, I know you have a coaching program, just all the wonderful things that you have. And uh, we definitely appreciate it in the uh, Whole Food plant-based uh, community. So thank you again for sharing your uh, expertise and time with us today. You're welcome. Thank you so much. <laughs> guys thank you so much for watching this episode um if you like this please share like and comment and subscribe to this channel and if this is a benefit for someone else please let them know about it but until next time next friday um at 5 p.m every wednesday thank you very much and please say goodbye to kathy davis <laughs> guys thank you so much for watching that episode we hope you enjoy it and please remember to like and subscribe down below so you can get continuous updates for future episodes and future guests and we can't wait for this upcoming season so don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you 